Ghana's relationship with the World Bank dates back to 20th September 1957 when Ghana signed World Bank Articles of Agreement to become the 64th member of the bank group. Six months earlier, the country had become the first in Sub-Saharan Africa to gain her independence and so became the toast of many freedom advocates from across the world. The moment was euphoric and magical. The leadership was inspirational and visionary, and the people were blessed with a great many of nature's bounties. Gold, diamond, bauxite, cocoa, timber, marine resource, great traditions, and a well-heeled educated elite. In charting her own path towards development, Ghana had to face up to many choices. Economic, political, social and even cultural choices. But half a century later, as Ghana celebrates her golden jubilee of nationhood, there seem to be even more challenging choices to be made than before. So why has Ghana not achieved her dreams yet? Why is Ghana where she is today? And where does she want to go from here? Given the tremendous resources that Ghana is endowed with, why does it have to depend so much on assistance from development partners? As is often said, no country, no matter how rich, could really make it without any support from abroad and in pursuance of partnership. One of the choices that Ghana made was to seek support from the World Bank and its affiliates. International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD, International Development Association, IDA, International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID, International Finance Corporation, IFC, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, MIGA. Ironically, in spite of several decades of financial and technical assistance from the bank and other development partners, the results are described by many people as mixed, while to many others, Ghana's woes are to be attributed to the harsh conditionalities imposed by the bank on successive Ghanaian governments who chose to borrow from the bank. This latter group of people have thus pitched running battles with the bank for bringing nothing but poverty and crippling debt to Ghana and the continent of Africa. There are no kind words to describe the excruciating poverty that our people have to face on a daily basis. There are no kind words to describe the unemployment that our people face. There are no kind words to describe the debt burden. There are no kind words to describe, you know, the imposition of policies on a people who have suffered years of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade and so on. This view may seem extremist, but such is the image the World Bank has unwittingly earned for itself in its mission to eradicate poverty in partnership with the developing world. And so in answer to the question, why the bank seems to be doing little to clean up its image in Ghana at least, Mats Carlson, who is the bank's country representative, says matter-of-factly, we are not in it for PR. Our work was never primarily about public relations and getting our message out, so to speak. If you look about how the World Bank was created, it was more about giving governments a chance to have extra financing and they would tell the story, they would do the thing. And yet for the bank, common wisdom dictates that when you light a lamp and proceed to hide it under a basket, its light will never be seen. So what is the World Bank really about in Ghana? Does the bank always give good advice? Will Ghana ever stop its dependence on the World Bank? How come we still grapple with access to basic social amenities like good drinking water, education, health and energy, in spite of decades of support from the bank and other development partners. For me, because I don't vote for the World Bank, I don't pay my taxes to the World Bank, 
I always think that I have more legitimacy holding my policymakers responsible. If they go into partnership with the World Bank and they charter a development paradigm, which they think that is not consistent with their aspirations and the promises they made to the people, and they take it, implement, and we fail, I don't hold the World Bank responsible. Rather than find the answers from the viewpoint of the bank's own officials and their counterparts in government, we invite you to join us on this odyssey into rural Ghana to get better understanding of the road Ghana and the World Bank have traveled over the last 50 years. The choice of a Futumampong in the central region of Ghana was dictated by the fact that the region was counted among the poorest four in the Ghana Poverty Reduction Strategy document. As we drive towards the village, we chant on a barely discernible line of moving shadows, young village women, each carrying a large enamel basin of water from, as we thought, a stream at the bottom of the valley. We are surprised to learn that the water has been harvested from a broken pipeline, which supplies water from the Cape Coast Waterworks to Futumampong and beyond. This pipeline has been broken for some time and no efforts are being made by the authorities to repair the damage. The challenges in rural water are even more daunting than we thought. During the dry seasons, Cape Coast experiences shortage of water. Whenever Cape Coast is experiencing it, a Futumampa also experiences it. There are people here who are not able to buy water from the stamp pipes. Come what may, they will go and fetch water from the stream. But luck is still smiling on a Futumampa. Unlike other remote farming communities, this village is spared the scourge of debilitating waterborne diseases like guinea worm and bilharzia. On a broader scale, the water problem is a major national development issue and the central region is only a part of the problem. The overall trend in rural water is encouraging, with at least seven active donors and solid results on the ground. The emphasis is on community-based approaches where communities make informed choices about their water and sanitation facilities and are responsible for its operation and maintenance. Currently, 51% of Ghana's 19.5 million people have access to water supply and 23% have access to sanitation. A 23% achievement in terms of access to sanitation is no success story. And yet, the attitude of Ghanaians with regards to sanitation seems to continuously dwindle towards the negative. A classic example is the 10 million US dollar sewer plant project in the Tema metropolis, one of Ghana's two port cities. It is very sad indeed to hear from the Tema Metropolitan Assembly that for want of only $23,000 to pay for monthly costs of electricity, a 10 million US dollar urban waste management project has been allowed to go waste. If this station has been in full operation, we'll be confronted with problems. If there's a sewer blockage and you go to try and unblock it, you see these racks, nets, uh, napkins, uh, sanitary pads, condoms, and all those things in the system. And these are not meant for the sewer. Can Ghana really move forward and achieve its development goals with this lamentable attitude towards the maintenance of public assets? To reach the Millennium Development Goals, it is expected that around 85 million and 81 million US dollars per year would be required for the water and sanitation sectors respectively. As we continue our journey to Afutumampong, we almost drive past another barely visible figure standing on the misty roadside by a heap of farm produce. It is Mr. Kwanza, whose family we are about to meet. With about seven headloads of palm fruits, Mr. Kwanza has come to the roadside to sell to the market queens who usually probe deep into the hinterland, buy farm produce at rock bottom prices. Kwanza is expecting to make about 60,000 CDs, about 6 US dollars. In addition to his palm fruit plantation, 
Kwanzaa also cultivates citrus, coconut, plantain and cassava. But the lack of direct access to markets is robbing him of good profits. Agriculture is the dominant sector of the Ghanaian economy, contributing 35% of the GDP and about three quarters of export earnings. Agricultural production is mainly rain-fed, small-scale and labor-intensive with high post-harvest losses of between 30 to 35%. The Afutu Mampong Primary School, freshly built and painted, stands in stark contrast to the rest of the buildings in the village. Built nearly two years ago with funds from the Ghana Education Trust Fund, the new school has only its doors and windows to install. With education as one of the prioritized areas for the bank, this is yet another testimony of how the collaboration between government and the World Bank in terms of education can make things happen for poor rural folk. Funds have been made available to build and furnish the school, as has happened throughout the country over the past couple of years. As it still happens in some schools throughout the country, the children would have been carrying stools and low tables themselves to school. So much money may be spent in upgrading physical infrastructure at the basic levels of education, but if a critical ingredient like a motivated teacher force is lacking at the front line, all other external interventions may not bear the desired fruits. In addition to serving the children of Afutumampong, the school's facilities are also open to their illiterate parents who congregate there for lessons in non-formal education. In the class are two of the Kwanzas, mother and 25-year-old daughter, sharing a table and zestfully reciting the alphabets. In the past two decades, the government, through support from the World Bank, has been able to provide over 80,000 classroom blocks and over 35 million textbooks. This has contributed significantly to ensure that Ghana is on track to meeting the Millennium Development Goals for Education. Though this may not yet be the case for many more schools across the country, the village of Afutumampong, one can say, is blessed as far as educational infrastructure is concerned. With about 26 pupils to one trained teacher, each of the 130 pupils can also have access to their own individual textbooks. And as soon as the doors and windows are fixed to guarantee the safety of the five computers donated by a son of a Futumampong, the children can begin to learn computing at this very basic level. And that's not all. There is even more to celebrate. Solar panels. They adorn the frontage of the school, a reminder of the fact that, even though most parts of the country are currently connected to the hydroelectric power from the Kusumbu Dam, a project for which Ghana borrowed from the World Bank, among other finances, to develop way back in 1961, solar power still remains a tremendous alternative source of abundant energy waiting to be harnessed. Vote for us. When we come, we'll give you electricity. You know, we've always been talking about electricity but they have not been doing it for us. We decided not to vote. It took all the politicians to come here one week and we'll do this. So we had to vote, of course. While the Futumampong Township itself laments its lack of access to the nation's hydroelectric power, necessity, as they say, is the mother of all invention. Out of the chief's bitterness about the grand power deception, hope is born in the chest of 11-year-old Kweku Joel Kwanza, the sixth child of Mr. Kwanza. He sought inspiration from the lack of power and has come up with this crude contraption, a sign of hope and potential for a future in electrical engineering. But for now at least, Kweku Kwanza and his schoolmates are able to learn after sunset with the aid of solar-powered lights. engaging the people of Afutumampong and probing for information on all key areas of funding by the World Bank, we are informed that Abena, Mr. Kwanza's four-year-old daughter, is seriously ill 
According to Madam Kwanza, it's nothing to worry about, just the usual bout of malaria. The Ghana Poverty Reduction Strategy, GPRS, gives priority to the health sector. And even though the sector is said to be enjoying tremendous donor support and donor coordination, there are still many challenges ahead. HIV AIDS, malaria, guinea worm and infant mortality. A futumampong may only be a microcosm of the general impact the activities of the World Bank is having on Ghanaians, especially in key sectors like water and sanitation, education, agriculture, energy and health. In all, the changes may not be monumental to some of its critics, but few can deny the modest strides made through the active partnership between Ghana on one hand and the World Bank and its sister organs on the other. Many challenges still exist, but Ghana is certainly not retrogressing in its long-drawn partnership with the bank to root out poverty. The ultimate choice to develop Ghana lies with Ghanaians themselves and not with the World Bank or any other external institutions for that matter. The question is, to what extent are the government and the people of Ghana ready to take their destiny into their own hands? The primary responsibility for our development is in our own hands. This brings back the whole idea of getting a national development framework. If you have your own framework, you know the direction in which you want to go. So if a development partner wants to come along and you think his development framework does not go with what you have, you have all right to drop the person. In many ways, the story of Afutumampong resonates the Ghana story, that at 50, there are numerous hurdles to overcome, but also that development efforts are showing results and must get better. The World Bank is encouraged by its own contribution over the past 50 years and feels greatly challenged to learn from its lessons and is willing to scale up support in critical areas of the economy where its services will be most needed.